I want to uh, first uh, again summarize Maimonides, and I want to show you another makor source of Maimonides from Hilchot Malachim in Mishneh Torah, which is interesting because what we read, which was taken from Mavo Leperek Helek, the introduction to chapter Helek in Sanhedrin, was written by a young Maimonides, maybe 24 years old. His Perush on the Mishnah is probably the second book that he wrote. The first book that he wrote is probably Milot Ahigayon, which was his book on Aristotelian logic, which he wrote in Ivrit. And uh, the second book he wrote was his Perush on the Mishnah. Um, both of them, by the way, were written in Arabic. His Meshneh Torah, which he wrote later on in his life, somewhere around 50, was also written in Arabic. Excuse me, not in Mishneh Torah, it's more in Nebuchim. But in Mishneh Torah, where he did write in his 50s, was already in Ivrit. At that point, Maimonides decided that Halacha has to be written in Ivrit. And he was actually one of the first. There was, uh, since the Babylonian period, uh, you know, in Babylonia, first the vernacular was Aramit, Aramaic, and all the responses were in Aramit. And then it switched to Aravit. With the Arabic conquest, all the um, responses became in Arabic. Rambam was the first to switch back to Ivrit in, in halachic matters at that time. Okay, <clears throat> again, I'm still slightly impaired with my speech. Well, it goes back and forth. So um, let's just look at this. Hilchot um, Malachim. So the Mishneh Torah, the laws of courts, and there's a chapter called the laws of kings and their wars. If you remember Kohen Rambam, he quotes the Talmud where Shmuel from Babylonia says, "Ein ben olam azeli mot hamashiach el hashiabud malchiot bilvad." There is no difference between the world as we know it, the messianic age, except for the fact that the Jews will be free from being subjugated to the nations, which means we will leave exile. We will come back to our land. And this is the simple meaning, of course, of the, uh, of the Torah and Vari, chapter 30. If your dispersed shall be at the four corners of the heavens, from there, God will take you back to the land. So for Rambam then, I would say the main aspects of the Messianic era is the end of the exile, the end of the Galut, Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, that the Jewish people will come back to the land of Israel, that there will be a political leader, a Messianic king, from descended from the house of David, and there will be world peace. And here, in Hilchot Malachim, Rambam adds, he'll build the temple. Let's read it right here. In the future, Messianic king will arise and renew the Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will build the temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. In his days, in his days, can't move it. The observance of all the mitzvot will return to their previous state. We will offer korbanot. We will observe the Shemitah and the Jubilee according to their particulars as described by the Torah. Anybody who does not believe in him or does not await his coming denies not only the statements of the prophets, but those of the Torah of Moshe, our teacher. As the Torah says specifically in Nitzavim, this is what I mentioned, chapter 30. God will bring back your ca captivity and have mercy upon you. He will gather you from the nations. Even if your diaspora shall be at the ends of the heavens, God will gather you from there and bring you to the land. These explicit words of the Torah include all the statements made by the prophets. Reference to the Mashiach is also made in the portion of Bilam. Again, Mashiach means a Davidic king. Mashiach means somebody who is anointed as the king of Israel from the Davidic line. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. But the goals that this political leader has to face in order to prove them worthy of this, as I said, four things, five things really. The end of the Galut, the ingathering of the exiles, Jewish sovereignty in Israel, world peace, and building the temple.
Those are the five ingredients which prove, I would say, um, retroactively that this individual is the messianic leader. So, and reference to Mashiach is made by Bilam, who prophesied about two kings. One was King David who saved Israel from its her oppressors and the final anointed king who shall arrive from his descendants. Like it says, Erenu below Atta. I will see, but not now. Um, I will perceive it, but not in the near future. So I, I, I see it, but not now. This refers to David. I perceive it, but not in the near future. This is the Messianic king. Darach kochav mi Yaakov, a star shall shoot forth from Jacob. This is David. A staff shall arise in Israel. This refers to the Messianic king, etc., etc. I'm going to jump over a little bit. Now, this is a very important statement of Rambam. One should not presume that the Messianic king must work miracles and wonders or bring about some new phenomena in the world, meaning nature will re remain as it always was. That's what Rambam said also in his introduction to Chalik. There still will be poor and rich. There still will be people tilling the soil, but Parnassah will come easily. So there won't be anything new in the world. He will not resurrect the de dead or perform similar deeds. This is definitely not true. Proof can be brought from the fact that Rabbi Kiba, one of the greatest sages of the Mishnah, was a supporter of King Bar Kochva, whose name actually was Shimon ben Koziba. They called him Bar Kochva from the word Darach Kochav Yaakov, a star shall shoot forth from um, Jacob. So Rabbi Akiva was a supporter of Bar Kochva, and he described him as the Messianic king. And he and all the Chachamim of the generation considered Bar Kochva to be a Messianic king. Until, of course, he was killed because of his sins. Once he was killed, they realized that he was not Mashiach. The sages never asked him for a sign or a wonder. Ot o mufet, never. The main thing is that the Torah, its statues, and its laws are everlasting. We may not add to them or detract from them. So basically, the Mashiach will also push people, influence them, encourage them to keep the Torah, etc., etc. Uh, by the way, look what Rambam also mentions. This was taken out by the censor. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who aspired to be Mashiach, was executed by the court is also alluded to in the book of Daniel. The vulgar among your people shall exalt themselves in attempt to fulfill the vision, but they shall stumble. Is there a greater stumbling block than Christianity? All of our prophets spoke of Mashiach as a redeemer of Israel, and their savior would gather the dispersed and strengthen the observance of the mitzvot. In contrast, Christianity caused the Jews to be slain by the sword, the remnants to be scattered and humble, the Torah to be altered, and the majority of the world to err and serve a God other than God. Rambam, by the way, considers Christianity um, shituf, which means believing in more than one God because of the Trinity. And that's why he does not consider it a pure monotheism. However, um, uh, he does consider Islam monotheism. So for Rambam, he has no problem if a Jew wants to visit a mosque. But he has a problem with the Jew who wants to visit a church. On the other hand, the Tosafists, who lived in France in the 12th century, including the grandchild of Rashi, Rabbeinu Tam, they argued that even though um, the Trinity for a Jew is not allowed, because a Jew believes in one God and that's it, but for a Ben Noach, a disciple of Noach, a son of Noach, as long as they believe in our God, it, they can even believe in another one. How do the Tosafists prove this? From the book of Malachim, Malachim Aleph 18, there's a story there that when Sancheriv conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, of Mamlechet Israel, Ephraim. So he didn't want to keep the land barren, empty, because he, all the Jews from the north, all the Israelites from the north, he sent them out eastward. He exiled them all. So in order for the land not to be barren, it says he brought in people from Kuta. And these were called the Kutim, 
which are also mentioned in the Talmud. And it says about the Kutim that they were pagans and lions started eating them up, Arayot. So what happened was, it says in the book of Malachim, Sancheriv asked the Kohanim who are living still there, what's going on? Why are lions eating up the people that I'm bringing in? And the Kohanim said, because when you're in Israel, you have to follow the laws of Israel. Mishpat Elohei Haaretz. You have to follow God's laws in Israel. To paraphrase, when in Rome, you have to be like a Roman. When you're in Israel, you got to follow the laws. So this guy said, okay, teach them, please, the laws that they shouldn't be eaten up by the lions. So the Kohanim taught them the laws. And it says that they started fearing the God of Israel and their God. And the lions stopped eating them up. That is called in the Talmud, Gerei Arayot. People who sort of converted to Judaism out of the fear of lions. And there's a, di there's a discussion in the Talmud whether the Kutim were actually converts or not. The Talmud does not consider them ta um, uh, normally converts. And neither does the Tosfos. So the Tosafot actually says the fact that the lions stop eating the Kutim despite the fact they believe both the God of Israel and their God, shows that a non-Jew, a Ben Noach, does not have to believe only in our God. They can believe in more than one as long as one of them is our, also our God. <laughs> they learned that from the Kuti. So according to the Tosafis, Christianity for a Christian is monotheism. For a Jew, it's not. <laughs> Meaning for a non-Jew, it's okay. For a Jew, it's not. But for Rambam, it's, he considers it a form of idol worship. Of which is interesting. So what I wanted to point out here, is this proof that Rambam brings, that the Messiah does not have to bring miracles because after all, Bar Kokhba was just a regular person. He was a good soldier. He knew what he was doing. Rabbi Akiva believed in him. When he died, they understood. They made a mistake. It happens. But he did conquer Jerusalem for three and a half years. So they really thought that something was going on here. Maybe he was going to be successful like the Hasmoneans like the Hashbunayim, but he was not. And the, even the slogan of the Bar Kokhva revolt was, remember the Maccabees, how they brought the Seleucid kingdom to its knees. Now, the Romans understood what was going on, and they put down the Bar Kokhva revolt in the most brutal way possible. You see, Ben Koziba, Bar Kokhva, was a very good military man, and he had a plan B. He knew that the Romans would take back, probably take back Jerusalem as a symbol. But he thought they would retreat to the city of Betar. When they got to Betar, the Romans will leave them alone because it's just a small town. Not worth the fight. So that's what happened. Jerusalem was conquered. They retreated to Betar, which today is in the Gush Etzion block. And the Romans decided we're going to make, um, we're going to make an, a teach an educational aspect out of this. And they went to Betar and they burned down the city and they killed all the men and left the bodies strewn in the fields for months. The Talmud says that they didn't allow the bodies to be buried for months and months so that people would see what happens when you try to rebel against the Roman government. And then after maybe six months, the Romans said, okay, now you can bury the dead. On the day the Romans said they can bury the dead, that was the day they instigated the fourth bracha of Birkat HaMazon, Atov Hametiv, which was probably instigated by the students of Rabbi Kiva. And Atov HaMetiv means that we say that God is good even when the good is a relative. Why well, was a relative good? We lost the war, but at least we can bury our dead with honor. That's Birkata Tova Meiti. So, um, yeah, <laughs> what I went to <clears throat> mention here. So, um, according to Rambam, then, you have what I consider a very rationalist approach to the Messianic era. He is more heavily based on the verses than he is on the Talmudic sources. We'll see now some of the Talmudic sources and see how it's different than Rambam. Rambam 
is not concerned on when the messianic era is going to happen, as opposed to the Talmud, who tries to quantify it. Um, Rambam even says himself in the letter to Yemen, Tipach Rucham He quotes the Talmud that says, May they be blasted, all those who try to calculate the end. Because it brings people to, um, you know, if you say the Mashiach is going to come in 20 years and it doesn't, people give up hope. You know that the Zohar implies in one place, depending on how you understand it, the Zohar in Parsha Doach, it says, Mashesh Mot Shana, on the 600th year of Noach, started and ended the Mabu, the deluge. And the Zohar says, in the 600th year of the six millennia, then the gates of wisdom from above shall be open, and the gates of wisdom from below shall be open. And there's this feeling it's going to be the beginning of the Messianic era. Feeling. The Zohar doesn't state that 100%, but people thought that way. Now, this was 1840. The 600th year of the sixth millennia is 1840, Tafresh. Hey, Tafresh. In, in 1840, in, the, in Jerusalem at the time, there were a lot of people talking in a messianic voice. Arya Morgenstern, the historian, wrote a lot about this, saying that 1840 is going to be the year. Don't worry, whatever. And what happened was in 1840, you had the... Um, blood libels in Damascus, where Jews were killed for, again, blamed that they needed the blood of Christian children, etc. And it was a, an awful year for the Jews. And uh, there are Jews who actually converted to Christianity because they had lost faith, because of the fact that everybody was sure that 1840 would be the year of who knows what. So it's very understandable why Ramam doesn't like talking about specific dates. It's not a healthy thing. He also opposes, he, he criticizes Sadia Gaon, who mentioned a date. So that's not the way to do things. You know, you want to talk about the idea, but we don't, we don't know what's going to happen until it happens, but this is the way I understand the general model of Maimonides. And for Maimonides, the most interesting aspect for me is the fact that Messianic era is just a normal world. A world where people care about each other. <laughs> a world where politicians actually want to do things good for the people. Okay? It's just a, a world where people are not killing each other, not stealing, not murdering, not raping, just like stuff that we, that we hope that normal people don't do anyhow. <laughs> so this is the Messianic age for Rambam. We've got so used to the fact that there always are wars that we can't even fathom such a thing. How can there be a world without wars? It's unfortunate. You talk about wars. People are worried about wars. Why? Because the stock market might fall. But then you have other people say, but if there are wars, there are economic opportunities, you can sell weapons, et cetera. So unfortunately, this has become part of the way people look at wars. Just another part of the human existence. But it doesn't have to be so. Okay, I'm now going to move to the Talmud. The Talmud, there are many different issues discussed in the Tractate of Sanhedrin of Chelek, which Maimonides gives his introduction to. So what I'm going to do is just point out a few of them, because it would take a long time to read through all of the discussions. I'll just point out a few things. I think are important for the discussion about Ramchal, and we'll see how far we get with Ramchal today. Okay, so we'll play. I'm going to open up in Talmud Sanhedrin 97a. Okay, everybody can see that. Now. Um... Okay, first there are the words here of Rav Katina. Rav Katina says here, one moment. This is the sabbatical year. Is a time when there are no more debts, once in seven years. So too, the world 
changes its existence every thousand years, and every seven thousand years, and every seven thousand years. So it says, and the Lord, God will stand exalted on that day. It says a psalm song from the Sabbath day, meaning 1,000 years is entirely Shabbat. As it says, for a thousand years in your eyes are just like a day past. This, by the way, statement of the um, Talmud is explained in Safra Ditzniuta. Safra Ditzniuta is a part of the Zohar. It's a little book found inside the Zohar. Safra Ditzniuta says, Shita alfei shnin. Um, um, as I say, um, get the word. Um, anyhow, it basically says that the 6,000 years are dependent on the six days or parallel the six days. Just like God created the universe in six days and there is Shabbat. So there are 6,000 years of history. Because it says, Elef shanim be'necha kiyom et mol. A thousand years in your eyes is like a day of yesterday. What are the days of yesterday? The six days of creation. So the six days of creation parallels 6,000 years of this world. In the 7,000th year, it's called Shabbat. What does Shabbat mean? According to the Kabbalists, Shabbat means the world starts to change. Doesn't go away. Remember on Shabbat, it's the same world. We just act differently. The world doesn't change. <laughs> on Shabbat, we refrain from work. We refrain from cre creativity, right? And the 7,000th year, human beings will start refraining from evil. Because something will switch. I'm already throwing a little bit of Ramachal in. So let me just keep going. The school of Eliyahu taught. 6,000 years is the entire duration of the world. Any history is 6,000 years long. Now this timeline of 6,000 years, by the way, we're now 5,783, right? Hey, Tafshin Pei 5,783. So we've got to hurry up. <laughs> we only have 217 years. To get our act together. Okay, so School of Eliyahu taught 6,000 years is the duration of the world. 2,000 are called tohu, chaos, tohu. 2,000 are characterized by Torah, alpaim tohu, alpaim Torah. And the other 2,000 are called yamot hamashiach, the days of Mashiach. Okay, that's the house of Eliyahu, which is very interesting. Now, this is a, the course of history, but due to our sins, the time frame has increased. And then there, because it says, this is what it says from the house, the Beit Midrash of Eliyahu, now there are a lot of stories, story, stories of Elijah the prophet. The Talmud believes that Elijah, because he never died, he actually appears to the sages at different times based on their merit. Ilui Eliyahu called the revelation of Eliyahu. Eliyahu the prophet appeared to Rav Yehuda, the brother of Salah Hasidah. He said, the world will exist no fewer than 85 jubilee cycles. No, no fewer than 4,250 years. And during the final jubilee, the son of David will come. Rabbi Judah said to Eliyahu, will the Messiah come during the beginning of the jubilee or the end? And he said, I don't know. Uh, here's another one, Ravashi. The last Amoraim said, to, this is what Eliyahu said to him, until that time, don't anticipate his coming. From that time forward, anticipate it. Of Hanan ben Chalaf, the sentiment of Trav Yosef, etc. Let's skip over again. Some interesting ones here. Now, about Rav Natan and Eliyahu. <clears throat> It says, though it tarry, wait for it, etc. How far are we? Oh, I see. Wait a second. 
Then there are these discussions exactly how long. Okay. Now there's an interesting question in the Talmud. Okay, there's another story. I must have already gone over it. Rav Natan meets Eliyahu in the Shuk. And he says to him, when is the Messiah going to come? So Eliyahu says to him, okay, ask him. He says, where is he? He says, sitting over there. <laughs> so he walks over to him. He says, okay, when are you coming? He says to him, today. He says, today? He runs home, packs his bags, all the bagage, <laughs> all the clothing, the vêtements. And then he waits, the sun goes down, day's over, nothing happened. The next day, Rav Natan goes back to the shuk and he sees the Mashiach sitting down there again, walks over to him, he says, what happened? You told me Hayom. Mashiach says to him, yes, it says in Tehilim, Hayom im bekolo tishmau. Today, if you listen to his voice, but the Jewish people have to listen to God's voice. <laughs> and then I come. So it's also an interesting Amudic story about Mashiach. So, okay, oh, 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 I want to just skip something. Right, right before this. <clears throat> now, okay, I'm just going to hold that for a moment. That's 97B. Let's try to understand what's going on here. You have 6,000 years. By the way, um, <clears throat> the Jewish enumeration of 5,783, according to the Talmud and Rosh Hashanah, is enumeration which begins on the sixth day of creation. So even though we say in the Tefillah, Ze hayom t'chilat ma'asecha, zikaron liyom rishon, this is the day, the beginning of your works, it's actually referring to the first day of Adam and Eve. Why? Because the universe before Adam and Eve for us was irrelevant. Because we human beings were not part of the universe. So it, it meant nothing to us. So we count from the first human being, which is Adam and Eve. So that means, by the way, that there is no Jewish enumeration of days one, two, three, four, and five. They could have been millions of years. There's no official enumeration of the first five days. Even the sixth day, the enumeration might have started when Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden. Meaning when the world changed, according to Ramchal, when it went from a metaphysical world to a physical world. And that's the enumeration. Because even the sixth day might have been a, been a very long day. I have an article I wrote about this years ago in Bar Ilan's uh, journal called Badad B'chod Rachecha De'ehu. It's a journal of science and Judaism. And I show that the, it's called, did the Kabbalists believe that the world was created in six days? And I bring eight different opinions, four from the early Spanish Kabbalists and four from later Kabbalists um, in the 19th and 20th century. Um, out of the eight opinions, only one <laughs> actually believes that the world was also created in six days, which is Nachmanides, Ramban. All the rest say, no, it was many, many years. Uh, just an example, Rav uh, Shlomo El Yashiv was a Kabbalist in Lithuania at the end of the 19th century. His um, grandson, Rav Shalom El Yashiv, was a famous rabbi in Mea Sharim, here in Jerusalem, passed away at the age of 104 and had 1,000 descendants when he passed away at the age of 104. Uh, Rav Cook um, introduced him to his wife, who was the, um, I think she was the, the daughter of um, uh, Rav Ari Levine, if I remember correctly. So um, so he was a grandson. So, and he was considered one of the, one of the most important poskim, halachic deciders uh, of halacha in Jerusalem uh, among the Haredi and the Datilimi world. 
So his grandfather, Rav Shlomo Elyasov, that was actually his name, Elyashov, Elyasov. Elyasov means the son of Eli, Eliyahu, the son of Elias, Elyasov. <clears throat> so he writes in his Drashot Olam HaTohu, his books are called the Leshem, Leshem Shvo Achlama. He writes there that it appears that each day of creation was very, very long. He said possibly thousands of years each day. But possibly, he doesn't actually know. So um, this is reiterated by others too. But I don't, if you want, you can read the article. <laughs> so I, I talk about it there. So um, most of the, there are even Kabbalists who say that the Torah doesn't even talk about how God created the universe. It only talks about how God governs the universe. Asher ben David, who was a nephew of the Ravad, Avraham ben David, was scared. Excuse me, he was a grandson of him. He was a nephew of, um, he was a nephew of Isaac the Blind. So he was a grandson of the Ravad of Puskir. So he, in uh, Kabbalistic documents that he was in his handwriting, which was published by Professor Danny Abrams from Bar Ilan. So um, there he claims that the Torah only talks about the fact that God created the universe in verse one. Reishit ba'alokim at shemayim at ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the were and the heavens and the earth. Period. After that, it's it's talking about how God governs the universe at every moment. That's his take on it. Even Nachmanides, who claims that the simple meaning of the verses are that God created the universe in six days also agrees with the Asher ben David that it's also talking about how God governs the universe. There is a secret side, esoteric side, and then there's the simple side, according to Nachmanides. It's a double reading, <clears throat> according to him. So, um, okay, um, how did I get to this? Let's go, go back now. So you have this concept of the 6,000 years. Let me explain this according to Ramchal. Once we're already talking about Ramchal, because it's when you take the um, sources from the Talmud, they're sort of like putty. <laughs> they're the materials, the building blocks. It, it, it's the Jewish philosophers and the Kabbalists who try to make sense out of them. Because when you take all the sources together from the Talmud, not all of them make sense together. So you need these scholars to give you a model. One of the important things of the writings of Ramchal and later on the Vilna Gaon is that they created a model. The Ramchal, his model is in Dat Vunot and Kinat Hashem Tzvot. He actually builds a model. The Vilna Gaon does not build a model, but I took 20 years to go through all of his commentaries to figure out what the model was. So, and that's in, in a book I wrote uh, called The World Hidden in the Dimensions of Time, The Theory of Redemption in the Writings of the Milligan. But it takes that long to put it together because the model is there, but he, does, he doesn't give you an easy time. He doesn't say, okay, this is the model. The only thing he does do in his commentary on Suffered It's Nuta, the book I mentioned before, which is a book, part of the Zoharic material, he writes in one place, he's talking about the redemption, he says, and if you under, he said, if you understood what I just said about the redemption, so I am now asking the reader not to tell anybody, please. I ask the reader to take a vow not to reveal it to anybody. Very interesting in the Gun's commentary who uh, suffered in Snuta. And if you read the book, you'll find out what I have to say about that too. But he doesn't talk about 1840, <laughs> what I mentioned before. But he does have an interesting commentary on the final um, 2000 years. So what does it mean? What is this timeline? Okay, let's go back to the timeline. According to Midrash Eliyahu, there's a timeline of 6,000 years a little hard to write here, but the timeline of 6,000 years parallels the six days, obviously. The first 2,000 is called oh, chaos. When is the end of the 6,000, by the way? 
Abraham. Abraham, according to Jewish chronology, the Jewish calendar, not the Gregorian calendar, which didn't exist then. According to the Jewish calendar, Tariq Ivri, Abraham was born in 1948. Sounds funny, but that's according to Seder Adorot, he was born in 1948. Abraham was 52 years old when you had to move from the second millennia to the third millennia. That means that moving out of chaos or moral chaos is when there is a human being who discovers God and discovers that the relationship to God is about a moral imperative, about doing the right thing. So Avraham takes the world out of chaos. He is the first one to discover not only God, but that belief in God is a moral imperative. I want to say something about that just in a few words. To be an ethical person means that I am willing to override my personal benefit if it is going to hurt others, right? That's an ethical person. Because sometimes I wanna do something, but I know it's gonna be at the cost of other people. That's called ethics. A religious person is somebody who doesn't wanna do something because it's a sin which means God decided. The Jewish way of thinking is that they're both connected. Both the moral imperative, where I say, that's a, by the way, Kantian ter terminology, both the moral imperative, and which says, I'm not gonna do something where I'm gonna hurt others, I'll find another way. And the Religious imperative of sin must come together because you can't have religion without ethics. Rav Kook calls it the two levels Musar Hativ Ivu Musar Kodesh. You have natural ethics and then you have um, sanctified ethics. Sanctified ethics because human beings don't understand, uh, they're not self evident but we can try to figure out what they mean. Keeping kosher is not self-evident. Keeping Shabbat is not self-evident, but it can enrich our lives if we understand what's going on. Uh, but not to steal is supposed to be self-evident. Not to murder is supposed to be self-evident. It's moral imperative. If a person understands religion as a sin is, is something we're doing against God, but I don't care if it affects men or not. That breaks apart religion because religion is based on the basis of derech eretz kadmala Torah, which means the moral way came before the Torah. By the way, what does it mean the moral way came before the Torah? It means that Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, who both found God and also found a way of righteousness, mishpat Tzedaka, it says about Avraham, they did this before Sinai. So that means that derech eretz, which means the moral way, came before the Torah, because the Torah was only given at Sinai. So the Torah was given approximately 3,400 years ago, but Avraham Avinu lives approximately uh, 3,800 years ago. So derech eretz kadmala Torah. I mean, historically, and that's to teach us that, by the way, this is how a child grows up too. Because with a, a person, you have to teach them first to be a mensch, to be a good human being. And then you take them further and you explain to them, you can't pretend to be a religious Jew if you're not nice to people. If you think that business is a joke and you can steal from people their problem if I lied to them. Okay, I told them the house is perfect and they took from them five million shekels, but the truth is it's a dump. That's called ona'a in Hebrew, <laughs> in halacha, okay? So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's not, uh, sometimes the hardest mitzvah to keep are in the business place. Whenever I meet businessmen, and I know quite a few who are, 
good people. I'm, I'm always very impressed. <laughs> it's impressed, it's not easy. You know you can make, make a little bit more if you just, <laughs> and you decide not to. It's really high madriga. Really, I'm, I'm totally convinced of that. And many have told me that in the, in the field of business. Okay, get back to that. So that's, Yahadu believes that you can't break it apart. Unfortunately, in the Western point of view, we, they see religion as being different than ethics. You could be a good person, what does that have to do with religion? And because of that, you have, which has affected Jews too, by the way, a lot of newly religious Jews, they don't think it's important. I take, I have my connection to God. I don't care about that guy. It's his problem. I'll throw eggs at him. I don't like him, right? So um, there used to be a fellow, his name was Rav Moshe Shapira from uh, Ofra, Iran, a uh, girls' seminary. He once said, we have a problem today, a conceptual problem of what a religious person is. Because if you see somebody, um, okay, let's say you see a person wearing a kippah and a beard, whatever, and they're sitting down at McDonald's eating a cheeseburger in, uh, I don't know, in London. You say, that's not a religious person. <laughs> I just saw them eating a cheeseburger in McDonald's. Right? They're charlatans. Right? But if that same person, let's say they're walking, uh, I don't know, through, you know, they're coming through the customs, they just landed, LL, whatever, and they have like all these, um, I don't know, um, cigarette boxes under their coat <laughs> and a few other things. I don't know what else they have stashed there. And they're walking through the customs. Custom guy says, excuse me, come over here. He says, no, no, I'm, I'm really got to go quickly. Come over here, please. They open up their coat and all these things fall out. <laughs> How come you didn't say anything about it? Okay, so say, well, uh, that religious guy is a thief. But wait a sec, doesn't it say in the Torah, Lotig Novun Vaikra 19? Are you not allowed to steal? So how can you call him a religious person if he's stealing? Didn't you say he's not a religious person because he ate a cheeseburger? But he can be a religious person and steal? What's that? This is a distorted picture of what it means to be religious. And unfortunately, there are even Jews who think that way because they've lived in these lands where people think that way. But the same Torah that says Lot Tignov is the same Torah that says not to eat um, a non-kosher animal. It's the same Torah. It doesn't differentiate. It doesn't say one's more important. You know, we have two lochot. There are two tablets that Moshe Rabbeinu brings down. And one of them is the mitzvah that says belief in God, Shabbat, honoring your parents. And the other one says not to steal, not to murder, not to bear fault witness. They both have five. They're both equal in size of the luchot. They're both equal in value and importance. And nowhere in the Torah it says one's more important. Oh, if we believe in God, that's okay. Huh? So I wanted to mention that. So again, so the world coming out of Tohu, out of moral chaos, is Avraham. Avraham teaches moral monotheism. It's not just monotheism, it's moral monotheism. Because God says, because I know him, that he's going to teach his children and everybody in his house to do Righteousness and justice. I know it. And Yaakov, when he blesses the children of Yosef, he says, Elohim asher ha um, um, asher hitalchu avotai lefanav. That God that my, that my fathers walked in front of. I mean, Avram Yenitzchak walked in front of God. What does it mean to walk in front of God? To walk in front of God means you got it. You understand what God wants. You can go in front. About Noah, who couldn't figure it out, it says, Et Elohim Noach. God, Noach walked with God. God had to hold his hand. He couldn't really figure everything out. But Avram Yenitzchak, they got it. They could walk in front. They knew exactly what God wanted. 
Elohim asher yitalchu alav avotay lefanav. Then hamalach ha-goel oti mikora yavarech et ha-neharim. The angel who keeps me away from all troubles shall bless the, these boys. So that's the first 2,000. The second 2,000 is called Torah, and it finishes with the, really the um, um, editing of the Mishnah by Rav Yudah Nasi around the year 4,000. That's called Torah, when the oral tradition starts becoming written. And the last 2,000 is called Yimot HaMashiach. Now, if the last 2,000 is called Yimot HaMashiach, why didn't it happen yet? Well, because it means, and this is the way the Vilna Gona understands it in Ramchal, it's called Yomot Mashiach because you have the possibility of Yomot Mashiach. But just like you have a, a you have a state called New York and you have a city called New York, so if you if it doesn't happen in the state of New York, it's going to happen in the city of New York. Which means if it doesn't happen in the beginning of Yomot Mashiach, it has to happen at least towards the end of Yomot Mashiach. So Yomot Mashiach means the possibility of the Messianic era. It cannot happen before the year. Um, before the, the fifth millennium. Rav Chaim Vital, the famous disciple of the Ari, Isaac Luria of Tzfat, in his introduction to Shmone Sharim, which is the first book that was written um, of the writings of the Ari and uh, edited by his son Shmuel Vital. So <clears throat> he says that even though the Talmud says it's 2,000 years of Yimot Mashiach, it's only theoretical, he says. He says the fifth millennia, it won't happen. The fifth millennia is called Galut. And we have already been in this Galut for over a thousand years. He says it can only happen in the sixth millennia. Why can it only happen in the sixth millennia? Because, and this is, an, I'm now giving an interpretation from the Vilna Gaon, but it it's aligns up exactly with Chaim Vital is saying. If you look at the creation story, remember six days represent 6,000 years. If you look at the creation story, Adam and Eve were only created on day six. So if the six days parallel the 6,000 years, the six millennia, it can only be in the sixth millennia because before that there were no people. <laughs> if you understand the parallel. So Chaim Vital says the, the sixth millennia is the only part of the 2,000 years from which it could actually happen. Before that, it's all theoretical. And it just will be the exile. Kol hayom dava, he says. Kol hayom dava. Why does he say kol hayom dava? Why does he quote that verse? Because it's the letters hod. The six millennia also represent the six firat, and the fifth one is hod. That whole day is considered alud. <clears throat> um, Okay, one other thing. I'm going to go to Ramchal at this point. Uh oh, we're at the end. Okay, I'll I'll take a few minutes because we start a little bit late. If that's okay, um, up to ten minutes. Ramchal in his book Dat Funot, which is a two-volume uh, series, um, he says he gives an introduction to how the messianic era is related to the creation story. If you remember in the creation story, you have six days of creation. Okay, we'll leave this one out. You have six days of creation. Day one, there is light. Day two, there is a firmament between the upper waters and the lower waters. Day three, God creates land. First, he creates seas and dry land, and then the plants and the trees. Amayim Kitov, two things are created on that day. Day three, excuse me, day two is the waters. That was day three was the land and the trees and the water. Day four are the me'orot, the heavenly bodies. Now the Midrash already asked the question, why was light created twice? Why do you have light on day one and light on day four? So if there's already a light on day one, what do you need a sun, moon, and stars for? And if the point was to create the sun, moon, and stars the way we know it, why did you need light on day one? And where, and where did it go? Rashi 
who very often bring, brings Midrashim when he has difficulty with the verses, he brings the famous Midrash on the first Pasuk. And he says, why is there a light? So the Talmud in Chagiga says, this light of day one was a special light. Adam olam A person could look through this light and see the whole universe from one side to the other side. Which person? I don't know, because there were no persons at the time, no people, but that's what it says in the Talmud and Chagiga. God saw the world was not worthy of such a light. He put it aside for the righteous in future times. Why was the world not worthy? What did human beings do that made them not worthy? They weren't even around yet until day six. That's not fair. And in fact, the light of day six is called me'orot. The luminous bodies, me'orot. In Hebrew, me'orot sounds like me'orot. It's coming from the lights, but it's not the original lights. The Midrash, the Midrash Rabbah says, why is the word me'orot written with out of vavs? Me'era, me'erat, because me'era in Hebrew means a curse. In other words, the world was cursed that instead of the original light, it got this sun, moon, and stars. So all this is strange. Ram Chal explains it like this. He says, this is all a metaphor. The original light means the universe that God creates. The universe that God creates is a perfect universe. It's a perfect world because perfection creates perfection. If God is perfect, then the world has to be perfect. When God, when it says that God saw the world was not worthy of this light, it means that human beings who are going to be created cannot sustain such a light because human beings are imperfect beings by definition. They are the created, they're not the creator. They are imperfect beings and they have to be imperfect beings because if they're perfect beings, what they're supposed to do. And if the world was perfect, what would we do here? <clears throat> a good person, let's say if they stay over a nice person's house, who's hosting them for a week, two weeks, after a while, you don't feel comfortable. <laughs> it's like, maybe I can wash the dishes, let me clean up a little bit. You know, I know how to do these things. You don't have to have, you know, wait on me hand and foot. I can do things. I'm not an invalid. So, and that's a healthy attitude. The Zohar says that God didn't want human beings to eat lechem boshet, the bread of shame. Bereshit are the letters. Um, yarei boshet, the fear of shame. Yarei boshet, bereshit. It's the fear of shame. What is the shame? That we didn't do anything. Yegia kapecha kitochel, asherecha v'tovlach. King David says, when you eat from the toil, the labor of your hands, then you're really happy. When I feel achievement in this world, I'm happy. So that is human nature. And God knows that's human nature because he created human beings. So we need an imperfect world. And of course, God puts Adam and Eve into a garden, to take care of this garden, which means to perfect the garden. In what way? It doesn't say. But God gives Adam and Eve a world which is imperfect on purpose, according to Ramchal, and they have to perfect the world. Ramchal says, Adam and Eve were given this task. If they would have perfected the world at day six, the world would have ascended again to the light of day one, which means a perfect world. And history would have been over. However, that's not what happened. <laughs> what happened was they did the one command they were not supposed to do, which was to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, as the Ari says, God knows in advance that Adam and Eve are going to eat from the tree because you do things which are in tune to your nature. Human beings can't live in a perfect world. So they know exactly where they're going. And now Ramchal has an interpretation of what 
the tree is worth. Remember, three in Hebrew is eights, which is the same root as the word eitsa, which means advice. The two trees are two types of advice. God puts the first man, who is the microcosm of every man that will be, the first woman, who is the microcosm of every woman who is going to be, into this place called the Garden of Eden, which is the seed or the microcosm of the world which is going to be formed. Anything that's going to happen in this laboratory between the first man, the first woman, and the seed of the world is going to affect the whole world. The slightest movement this way, if you have a seed and you damage that seed, the trees are going to come out like this. <laughs> it won't be like that. So whatever Adam and Eve do in this incubator, in this laboratory, is going to affect the rest of history. And the, whatever, and the, whatever they're going to do is the nature of what's going to happen because they represent all of human beings at the same time. Because all human beings are coming from them. So they actually re relate to every human being. There's even a Midrash in the Zohar that says that every soul that is born in the 6,000 years comes somewhere from the body of Adam. Some come from the head, the intellectuals. Some come from the arms, the ones who are creative. <laughs> some come from the legs who push the world forwards. Some from, come from the heart, like the ones who write poetry and music. <laughs> Everybody comes from a different part of Adam. So <laughs> um, you have this concept. And, uh, and they all have to come out because it's different parts of, we're all different parts of Adam coming to fruition, coming to uh, actuality. So when Adam and Eve are sitting there in the garden and they actually eat from the tree, what is the tree? The tree of life is after they perfect the world, they eat from the tree of life, and then the world goes back to what it was. That's called the tree of life. Goes back to what it loves, meaning the perfect world. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. What is that? There's an interesting interpretation of Maimonides, but I won't do that because we don't have the time. I'll just tell you in a nutshell where Ramchal says. Ramchal says the difference between the Garden of Eden, which is a sort of metaphysical world, which is one rung of the ladder before the physical world. It is a microcosm. It's the seed of this world, but it's not yet this world. In the hierarchy, right, the Kabbalah has a sort of Platonian idea. The world goes from actual spirituality or perfect spirituality to perfect physicality in a gradation of emanations. That's the early Kabbalah. So when Adam and Eve are looking at the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, they're looking at a different world. Why is our world here, where we are right now, we're in the tree, by the way. Our world is already in the tree. They're outside the tree. When they look at the tree, they can understand the tree from afar, but it, they don't feel the tree. Okay? It's sort of like if you've never been to planet Earth and you want to learn about planet Earth and you come across Wikipedia. <laughs> You're on your computer, start reading Wikipedia. Yeah, too many things here. Let's look for another one. Okay, then you find the Stanford Encyclopedia or you find Britannica online. Ooh, they did what in World War II? <laughs> What's wrong with these people? <laughs> they started smoking in the 20th century to kill themselves. What's going on? They could have solved cancer, but instead they want to make money. What's going on? Okay. I mean, they would be shocked. A lot of things in our world. Now, Adam and Eve know all this about human history. They're, it's like they're reading in the encyclopedia of what human history is. They know all about it because they are human. They're just not in that particular um, mindset, but they're definitely human. So they understand. Um, if you want to put it this way, Adam and Eve don't feel themselves as a body. Somebody once gave an imagery like this. Let's say you are sitting on, Adam is sitting on a male horse and Eve is sitting on a female horse. And then the male horse and the female horse like each other. That's cute, right? But, on, but I'm not the male horse and you're not the female horse. Adam and Eve didn't see themselves as bodies. They saw themselves as human beings. 
which are beings with the soul. Of course, we have a body, but, but we are first and foremost human beings who are have consciousness and are beings that have a soul. So when Adam looks at Eve, it doesn't matter if she's wearing clothes or not. Right? He will still, if he's interested in Eve, they'll get together, they'll have a cup of uh, fig leaf tea, <laughs> and they'll talk, okay? They, they have no problems. After the sin, what is the sin according to Ramchal? What does it mean to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? It means that good and evil is now part of your consciousness. They knew what good and evil was before, but now it's part of their consciousness. It's now, I want something which is no good. I walk into that store and I like that coat and I don't have the money, I really want that coat. And now I have to rationalize, how am I gonna get the coat, right? So it's now a struggle within my own consciousness. Do I just do the right thing, even though I know it's the right thing, or do I do what I want to do at this moment. It becomes a struggle. When you're in the tree, it's a struggle. When you're outside the tree, it's easy to pick because it's not a struggle. Do I do the right thing or the wrong thing? Hey, I do the right thing, that's it. <laughs> this is God's garden of Eden. I'm gonna do the wrong thing. We think I'm crazy. But once you're in the tree, I get mixed up. I mean, I want to do the right thing, but you know, I always say, I say Adam and Eve before they ate from the tree. This is also according to Ramba. So I always say like this. It's like if Eve would walk into, let's say Adam and Eve are without clothes, right? So Eve walks, is walking on the Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and she comes across Saks Fifth Avenue, this fancy women's clothing store. And she walks in and she sees a fur coat. She says, wow, <laughs> I would really look good in that fur coat. She puts on this rabbit hair fur coat. She's looking in the mirror, amazing. Says, uh-oh, God didn't grade me with money. I don't even have a credit card. <laughs> How am I gonna pay for this coat? She looks around, she notices everybody is on break. They're having a lunch break and there's nobody there. The door is wide open. She could actually just walk out with fur coat. Now Eve, before eating from the tree, will say to herself, wait a sec, is this right or wrong that I'm taking the coat? wrong. It's called stealing. It's not mine. She puts it back on the rack, walks out of South Fifth Avenue, and of course gets arrested for, by the police for uh, uh, walking uh, <laughs> a public, uh, what do they call it, exposure. Right. But um, yeah. But that's, that's before. Eve after, what they call indecent exposure. Yeah. Eve after eating from the tree, she walks again into Saks Fifth Avenue, and it's February, and it's cold in New York. And she puts on the fur coat and she said, wow, this is amazing. I feel so warm in this coat. And she says, wait a sec. I don't have a credit card. I don't have money. And she looks around and sees there's nobody there. She says, wow, what am I supposed to do? And she's talking to herself now. Eve, you know that it's not your coat. Put it back on the rack. And she's talking to herself. Yeah, but you know, it's so unfair. I'm going to freeze out there without a coat. It is now zero degrees in New York. And besides this coat on the rack, all these people who are against anyhow fur in New York, that he won't be able to sell it to anybody. Who can sell a fur coat today in New York? This is a real fur coat. I'm doing him a favor by taking it off the rack. He might be attacked by all these environmentalists who know what, animal lovers. You should just take it, right? No, I'm not saying you will. I'm just saying she's gonna struggle for a while <laughs> with that decision, because it's not gonna be an easy decision because that's the way we live our lives. So Adam and Eve before the sin, they knew exactly what good and evil was, but it was less of a struggle. It wasn't inside them. The Midrash says that the snake went into Eve's body, which is symbolically meaning she's part of the tree as the snake was on the tree, okay? In other words, okay, this, uh, this is, uh, okay. So according to Ramchal though, it's more than this. The world that we live in, as opposed to Adam and Eve is called the world of experience. Adam and Eve were living in a laboratory. They could look on the computer and understand everything about human history. That was it. 
They didn't need to experience everything in life. We live in a consciousness where we want to experience everything. Where a child is five years old and he sees fire and the parents say, don't touch the fire. <laughs> it's going to burn you. He's going to do it at least once and burn himself. Then, okay, I won't do it again. We have this need, this curiosity. We want to know everything. You know, in fifth grade, you tell children that you shouldn't take drugs. It's dangerous. You know? Don't, don't drink too much alcohol. You'll get hooked. You'll need rehab. It's really difficult. And you'll bring in, bring in people who did rehab from drugs and people who did rehab from alcohol. And they'll tell their terrible stories and all the children will listen. And still 10, 15, 20% of them will be stuck in alcoholism and drugs. Why is that? Because we have this need to experience. Now, when you experience, now you really understand the problem. The problem with the experience is that it's hard to get out of it. If you're an alcoholic and you stop drinking, you're basically a dry alcoholic. But the, the need is still there. It's a constant fight for the rest of your life. Drugs, the same thing. So <clears throat> that's a, so the Eitzah Da Tovara, Da'at in Hebrew means to connect. Adam Yadat, right? To connect the good and evil at the same time. We're connecting at the same time. It throws us off. You have to think twice when these things happen. This world of experience, God says to Adam and Eve, okay, you wanted the world of experience? Come back in 6,000 years, we'll talk. <laughs> because now it it's a game changer. You can't be back in the garden, bye-bye. And there are these angels with the sword, which goes back and forth. And the entrance to the garden, you can't come back this way anymore. But don't worry, 6,000 years, we'll see you again. So according to Ramachal, the 6,000 years is everything Adam and Eve was not able to do on that sixth day replays itself in the sixth millennium of the 6,000 years. Okay, I think that's enough for today. And uh, we, I will continue this one uh, next week where I will continue the idea of Ramchal, how this plays out. I'll connect it to more sources in the Talmud in Sanhedrin on pages 97, 98, and 99. And then from there, I'll proceed to the Vilna Gaon, who also creates a model out of this idea. And just like Rambam takes the model right to the end, what is supposed to happen in the various phases. And it reconnects to Rav Cook in his interpretation of Joseph and Judah. Da everybody.